So with that, we're going to shift upriver to essentially upriver of Bonneville to the Columbia Plateau, uh, at least in how we define it in the avian world, uh, or avian land management world. With that, like Jake said at the beginning, we're essentially in year five of implementing the Inland Avian Plan, which is addressing RPAs 47 and 68. Um, with that, essentially, goal being where we settled in the plan was a two-part plan to uh, reduce the goose and crescent Caspian tern colonies. With that, we, like I said, we're in year five. We um, implemented a goose in the first year in phase one, uh, did our habitat enhancement at Dot Edwards in 2015, and then started implementing as well at Crescent uh, in 2000, starting in 2015, planted Crescent Island with willows and other vegetation in 2016, and again this year in this last one in 2018. So with that, we're moving, essentially wrapping up kind of what I'd call active implementation of the inland plan, where we're um, essentially down at Crescent, as Ken will get it to do in his presentation. Um, we haven't had any activity at Crescent. It's pretty well vegetated at this stage. Don't expect any use there in future years. And then Bureau of Reclamation, that is the owner and responsible for Goose Island, will essentially continue status quo for at least the next few years at Potholes. Uh, for Goose Island and Potholes Reservoir in general, and um, go from there. With that, I will turn this over to Ken for 2018 results, and, um, for the colony and general plateau results before we wrap up with Alan at the end for prediction rates. Hello everyone. Uh, I was feeling like Albert Brooks in uh, broadcast news earlier. Some of you might know what I'm talking about. Uh, luckily, I'm okay now. Um, anyway, um, I'm here to present results from the implementation and evaluation of the Inland Avian Predation Management Plan in 2018. Um, I thought I'd start off by providing you with some background on this uh, management plan, uh, uh, which is uh, underway now. Um, uh, first of all, Caspian terns that nest in the Columbia uh, Plateau region, uh, early research has shown, eat juvenile salmonids and are limiting uh, the recovery of some ESA-listed stocks, in particular steelhead stocks from the Snake and Upper Columbia River. A management plan was developed to eliminate tern nesting at the Goose Island uh, colony in Potholes Reservoir and at Crescent Island on the Columbia River, the two largest turn colonies in the region. In concert with that, alternative nesting habitat was created for terns outside the Columbia Basin in hopes that terns displaced from the Columbia Plateau would relocate to nest at these sites. The managed turn colonies are at Crescent Island, shown here in this photograph. Uh, the whitewashed area that you see in this, this photograph is the tern colony, uh, and they are surrounded by nesting gulls. Note the open, uh, bare ground habitat that terns uh, use for nesting here. The other managed Caspian tern colony is at Goose Island uh, in Potholes Reservoir. Once again, the whitewashed area is the uh, area of nesting terns, and they are also surrounded by nesting gulls at this site. So to prevent nesting at these uh, two managed locations, uh, we used passive nest dissuasion that consisted of uh, stakes, rope, and flagging, uh, vertical fence rows, and or vegetation plantings on Goose and Crescent Islands. This photo to the right shows uh, stakes, rope, and flagging that was used as the uh, uh, passive nest dissuasion action at Goose Island. In addition to that, active nest dissuasion was carried out, which consisted of human hazing. In the event that turn eggs were collected, we were issued a permit to collect those eggs at Goose and Crescent Islands to prevent colony formation. We were then tasked with monitoring the, the region-wide turn population, both at managed sites and unmanaged uh, turn colonies to look for changes in the nesting distribution and colony size throughout the Columbia Plateau region. 
And then finally, we collected pit tags that were placed in juvenile salmonids that were deposited on turn colonies to assess if management led to any reductions in uh, uh, turn impacts to smolts. This shows uh, the timeline uh, for implementation of the Caspian Turn Management Plan over the last five years. 2014 was the first year of turn management at Goose Island in Potholes Reservoir, and the, that colony was managed in every year subsequent. 2015 was the first year of management at the turn colony at Crescent Island on the Columbia River, and again, that colony was uh, managed in every year through 2018. In 2016, we saw that some of the birds displaced from the Goose Island colony were trying to colonize sites in Northern Potholes Reservoir. Uh, so in 2017, uh, we were given permission to uh, manage uh, terns that are attempting to nest in Northern Potholes Reservoir, and that occurred in 2017 and 18. And as Dave mentioned, uh, 2018 marks the completion of the initial phase of turn management in the Columbia Plateau region. On to the 2018 project results. This is with funding from the core uh, BLR and the Priest Rapids Coordinating Committee. Turn nest dissuasion on Crescent Island. The photo to the right is Crescent Island. The uh, uh, passive uh, nest dissuasion methods used there were vertical fence rows that you could see in the, the black uh, parallel lines you see there. There's also stakes, rope, and flagging used on the site. It's very hard to see in this photograph. And then willow plantings and other native vegetation was used. And as you can see, the island has become almost completely vegetated um, and uh, very little bare sand or bare ground habitat available at the site post-management. So passive nest dissuasion alone was effective in preventing turn nesting and roosting at this site. Because of that, active nest dissuasion was not necessary here. We never saw terns even attempt to roost on the island, let alone nest. And again, no eggs were laid, so no uh, turn egg collection was not necessary. This graph shows the historical colony size of terns at Crescent Island. Uh, the sort of tan line there is the uh, pre-management average. Uh, about 400 breeding pairs used this site prior to management. Uh, beginning in 2015 is when management was uh, implemented at this site. And as you can see, in six, 15, 16, 17, and 18, there was no nesting pairs at this site. Turn nest dissuasion at Goose Island. Uh, the passive nest dissuasion measures used here was stakes, rope, and flagging. Uh, Goose Island is a high elevation island. It's very rocky, very little topsoil. So vegetation to this point has not been able to take hold as it, as it has on, on uh, Crescent Island. So passive nest dissuasion, the stakes, rope, and flagging was mostly effective in preventing turn nesting and roosting at this site. Active nest dissuasion is necessary at Goose Island, especially along the shoreline as the reservoir, reservoir levels drop uh, throughout the breeding season. Basically what happens is we have uh, stakes, rope, and flagging that go all the way down to the water line, but as the reservoir levels drop, it opens up uh, open habitat that terns have used for uh, nesting uh, or attempting to nest and also roosting. In every year of management, turn eggs have been laid at this site, um, and uh, egg collection was necessary to prevent colony formation at Goose Island. This is a graph of the historic colony size at Goose Island. The uh, tan line there, again, is the uh, pre-management average. About uh, 370 breeding pairs used this, this site uh, prior to management. 2014 was the first year of management at this site, and there was a small colony that became established on a rocky islet just off of Goose Island during that year. Uh, in 2015, there was one breeding pair that laid eggs and reared young. 
Um, they were actually underneath the nest dissuasion, fairly unusual. Um, and then in 2016 through 2018, there was no nesting by terns at this site. This gives you a little bit, uh, another uh, view of what's going on at, at Goose Island. This is colony attendance, or the number of adults counted on colony throughout the breeding seasons. This, this top line in red is the pre-management average. You can see that it, uh, the colony kind of peaks out in mid-May. At, at that time, uh, on average, over 500 adults were counted. In every year of management, the first year is the brown line, 2014. You can see that there was far fewer terns utilizing the island. Um, and then in every year subsequent, uh, fewer and fewer terns. Um, the brown uh, uh, bars represent the counts of birds in 2018. Uh, what we're seeing is that terns are uh, continuing to, 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 to they have a strong fidelity to this site. And uh, they're essentially coming and visiting the site in June and July, late in the breeding, breeding season. We think that these are birds that are primarily post-breeding birds or failed breeders from other sites that are prospecting at Goose Island for maybe a future nest site. Again, these birds are utilizing the shoreline area that becomes uh, uh, available once the reservoir level drops. This map shows the Columbia Plateau region and the turn colony locations, both managed and unmanaged colonies. Uh, the, uh, let's see if I get this. This is uh, uh, the managed site at Goose Island, which is just east of the, the uh, Mid-Columbia River. The other managed site is at Crescent Island, which is on the Columbia River just below the Snake River confluence. And then there are um, uh, five other colonies that are un currently unmanaged where terns nest. One is at Twining Island and Banks Lake. Another is at Lake, uh, a small island in Lenora Lake. Uh, another island is, uh, uh, another site is Harper Island and Sprague Lake. These sites are all located off the Columbia River but based on pit tag recoveries, we know that birds utilizing these sites are commuting to the river to forage on juvenile salmonids. The two uh, other sites are located on the Columbia River. One is at Badger Island, which is just upriver from Crescent Island, and the other is at the Blaylock Islands, which is just below McNary Dam. This table shows uh, colony sizes uh, at all the turn uh, colonies in the Columbia Plateau region. Uh, prior to management is uh, the uh, first column, uh, the averages. As I mentioned, the two largest colonies in the region prior to management were Goose Island and Crescent Island. Uh, between the, those two sites, 88% of the breeding pairs in the region were on those two, col those two colony sites. The rest of the colony sites are, are quite small by comparison. Um, prior to management, the total region-wide breeding population was 874 breeding pairs. 2018, that's the data from this uh, last year. Again, as I mentioned, there was no nesting of terns uh, on Goose or Crescent. Um, there were four active tern colonies uh, during that year, a small colony on Badger Island, uh, uh, the largest colony in the region now at the Blaylock Islands at 314 breeding pairs, uh, and then colonies in Lenora Lake and Sprague Lake. Uh, the total number of breeding pairs in 2018 was 492 breeding pairs. It's about a 44% decline from the pre-management average. So I'll have you sort of pay attention. Oops, sorry about that. Pay attention here is to the Blaylock Islands. Prior to management, that colony was small. Um, on average, 59 breeding pairs. Many years, it was far smaller than that. Um, and then post-management, uh, we've seen a big increase in the size of that colony. Based on band resightings, you know, terns that were previously banded uh, and resighting of those birds and a satellite telemetry study that we've done, we know that at least some of the birds that have recently colonized the Blaylock Islands have come from Crescent Island. So the Blaylock Islands is of concern to many fishery managers. Uh, Al Evans will give a talk after mine that talks about predation impacts 
um, um, which is really where the rubber meets the road here. Um, but anyway, this graph shows a little bit about what's going on in this calling has been for a number of years now. The brown line is the number of attended nests at that colony in 2018 uh, throughout the breeding season. The orange uh, line is the John Day Reservoir pool elevation. As you can see, the, the peak in number of nests was over 300 uh, active nests that occurred, I believe it's in late April. Um, and this is at a time where the pool elevations are relatively low. Uh, it, beginning in May through early June, we had a spike in the uh, pool elevations in uh, John Day Pool that resulted in quite a bit of nest failure at this site. The, the site that they used for breeding the blowax is low elevation gravel bars that uh, are prone to flooding when the pool elevations are high. So um, essentially what happened is we had a great deal of uh, uh, nest failure during these flooding events, uh, and the colony never really recovered after that. So summary of management results. In 2018, there was no turn nesting at Goose or Crescent Island, so the uh, uh, management actions and nest dissuasion actions were successful in preventing uh, nesting at, that, at those two managed sites. This represented a 44% decline in the region-wide uh, breeding population of terns, um, suggesting that terns are beginning to move to nest at sites outside the basin. Despite this, however, there still remains strong fidelity of terns to the region. Terns are still attempting to nest in Potholes Reservoir, and some are relocating to nest at other colonies in the Columbia Plateau region, uh, most notably the Blaylock Islands. And then finally, uh, I, I think uh, we can all uh, be glad that, uh, that this management action has been successful in reducing, reducing predation uh, on juvenile salmonids in the Columbia Plateau region. Uh, Al Evans will be presenting these results following me, but uh, we found that there's a strong relationship between turn predation and smolt survival and smolt to adult returns, and Al will be presenting those data here in a moment. I'd like to acknowledge uh, our research partners at Oregon State University and USGS. Uh, also, uh, funding from the core BOR and the Priest Rabbits Co Coordinating Committee, and then our cooperators who provided us with permits to get, gain access to the sites and, and to uh, uh, pit tag fish as part of Al's work uh, from U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, and NOAA Fisheries. With that, I will take any questions that you might have. Just can't wait for Alan's talk. All right. Thank you.